Hello and welcome everyone to uh, this uh, webinar on disability and indigenous rights. My name is Maria Montefusco and I will be the moderator uh, for today's meeting. And now I would like to ask you to imagine that you are not in front of your computer screen, but sitting together with us all in the beautiful culture center Sayas in Inari, in the northeastern lands of Sápmi. And here we will spend two days together, learning and enjoying time together. This seminar or webinar is organized as a cooperation between the Nordic Welfare Center, uh, the Nordic Dementia Network, uh, the Council of Nordic Cooperation on Disability, the Ministry of Social Affairs and Health, uh, in Finland, the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare, the Sami Parliament in Finland, Sami Soster, the Advisory Board for Rights of the Persons of Dis with Disabilities, Vane uh, in Finland, and the Finnish Human Rights Center. So as you hear, this has been a true exercise of cooperation uh, that we will try to present the result of here today. In the Nordic region, our history and ways of living and surviving up here in the north lies on the rich heritage, the knowledge and practices of Inuit and Sami cultures and languages. Sami and Inuit cultures and languages still enrich the diversity and the knowledge of the region. But living with a disability or dementia in a sparsely populated area can be very difficult. At the same time, providing the social service and support in sparsely populated areas is also a challenge. And the rights of persons with disabilities with indigenous background are not always respected. And we have all the reason here today, all of us to meet and learn and to do better. And this is why we are here. So the questions for today and tomorrow are, how do we respect? And how do we implement the rights of indigenous people with disabilities, including dementia, in the Nordic region? What are the challenges to meet the needs of uh, these groups in sparsely populated areas? And this first day of the two uh, is human rights of indigenous persons with disabilities, including dementia. And now I have the pleasure to present the first speaker of the day. Uh, we have Janne Hirvaswapio, uh, who is the member of Social and Health Committee of the Sami Parliament in Finland. And uh, Janne is also a representative of the Sami Parliament in the National Board on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which is also the monitoring mechanism for the UNCRPD, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Janne, are you with us? I am here, thank you. Over to you, Janne, thank you. Dear listeners, on behalf of the Sami Parliament in Finland, I want to warmly welcome you all to discuss today and tomorrow on Indigenous persons with disabilities and multiple discrimination that they are exposed to, taking special account of people with dementia. My name is Janne Hirvaswopio and I am a member of the Social Affairs and Health Committee in the Sami Parliament in fin Finland <clears throat> and the representative of the Sami Parliament in Advisory Board for the Rights of Persons with disabilities. First, we would like to thank all the organizers, Nordic Welfare Center, Nordic Dementia Network, Council of Nordic Cooperation on Disability, Ministry of Social Affairs and Health, Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare, Sami Soster, Advisory Board for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and Finnish Human Rights Center for the hard work to make this webinar happen. Planning of this event started by the initiative of Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare last autumn 2020. It is thus a great pleasure to be here today 
with you and change ideas and views on this extremely important topic. When discussing persons with disabilities or on discrimination faced by them, people often stay at very general level. Indigenous peoples or peoples belonging to minorities are not specifically or particularly taken into consideration and multiple discrimination that they are exposed to is not recognized at different levels in Nordic societies. When it comes to the rights of indigenous persons with disabilities, the topic is often approached from very one-sided perspective. Intersectional approach to the rights of indigenous persons with disabilities is still at the margins in our societies. Thus, we truly hope that by providing platforms for discussion, we can change the situation. For us Sami, our people living with or without disabilities are important and valuable members of our society. As indigenous persons, Sami with disabilities also have the right to their own languages and their own culture throughout their whole life cycle. It should of course be self-evident when it comes to minorities in societies, majority groups view them too often as one homogenous group. The need of those people representing minorities within minorities are not recognized well enough. We hope that this will change in the future and different backgrounds of people will be considered while making decisions, finding solutions or developing new technologies and assisting devices to help them in their everyday lives. We hope that this webinar will develop and add discussion and understanding on the topic and bring new concrete ideas to the table. We also hope that after this webinar, these concrete ideas will turn into concrete actions in order to improve the situation of indigenous persons with disabilities. On behalf of the Sami parliament, and on my own behalf, I wish you all a great seminar and a fruitful discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, Jan Irva. So, uh, so, um, uh, now I forgot your name. I have it here. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, I, I should have been up in, in, uh, in Sayos and, and had you beside me and we could have talked. Hirva Sopio, Janne Hirva Sopio, I am so happy to, uh, to um, thank you so much. And uh, uh, so your, your words just came right into our hearts and um, it's just a wonderful uh, feeling of being uh, together in this, in this webinar. Now, it's my pleasure, a little bit early, but I, I know that you're with us, Paula, uh, to leave the word to the Secretary General of the Nordic Council of Ministers, uh, Mrs. Uh, Paula Lettomäki. Thank you, Maria, and good afternoon for you all, and warm greetings from sunny Copenhagen uh, to this webinar. I would also like to thank for this fabulous uh, yoiks uh, we have just heard. And I would like to thank the Finnish presidency for placing the indigenous people's rights high on the presidency's agenda. The topic of today's webinar, rights of indigenous peoples, is an important topic on the Nordic agenda as well. We certainly need to increase awareness and understanding of both the conditions and rights of indigenous persons with disabilities and dementia. We need to share knowledge, experiences and good practices in this field. In my opening remarks, I would like to share with you how the Nordic Council of Ministers works with socially sustainable development and indigenous peoples in the Arctic area. The Nordic Prime Ministers adopted a new vision for the Nordic Corporation in August 2019. The vision sets the goal for the Nordic region to become the most sustainable and integrated region in the world by 2030. 
it is an extremely ambitious target and sets the guidelines to our work on the coming years. The vision means that Nordic countries together are determined to lead the way and to find good solutions for the future in all areas of our society. One of the specific aims of the Nordic cooperation is equal and safe health and well-being for all people living in the Nordic region by building a sustainable society where no one is left behind. The Nordic countries are also Arctic countries, so it is only natural that the Nordic Council of Ministers has a specific program for co of cooperation that focuses on the Arctic region. The Arctic Cooperation Program puts in particular focus on indigenous peoples and supports projects and initiatives which aim to improve their livelihoods. Creating new opportunities for people in the sparsely populated Arctic is given a priority. The different languages and identities enrich the Arctic area but can also cause challenges for those with a disability or a dementia. Long distances to healthcare services, along with low quality of the services available, poses practical challenges with which we are focused on solving. In order to provide new possibilities for a better quality of life and services in the region, we work on projects to develop connectivity, distance education, and e-health in scarcely populated areas. Equal access to services is not just about tackling practical problems. Policies on disability must be viewed from a human rights perspective as well, which the United Nations Convention on the Human Rights of Persons with Disabilities also emphasizes. The purpose of Nordic Cooperation on Human Rights and Disability is to create platforms to exchange knowledge and experiences of effective instruments so that we can implement the UN Convention. There is a long tradition of Nordic research cooperation on disability. Helsinki University is now coordinating a NordPlus project with the aim to establish a Nordic master's program on human rights and disability. Such efforts help raise awareness of the challenges people with disabilities experience. Another important area is discrimination. We know how the experience of unfair treatment impacts people's actions, life choices, and shapes identities and social relationships. And being able to speak and express oneself is one, in one's own language is crucial in this regard. We have to find new solutions and design services which address these issues and see the individual in a holistic perspective. We highly appreciate the active participation of civil society in the Nordic cooperation. Therefore, I am convinced that the stronger dialogue and cooperation with civil society organizations, such as Sami Sosta and Tiliog, can be part of the solution in these matters. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by thanking everyone participating in the planning of this unique webinar. I hope it has been a rewarding process for all different participating organizations. Nordic Council of Ministers is an active partner in Arctic cooperation and has a focus on improving indigenous people's possibilities to live good life in their home areas. I'm confident that also today we can find some more concrete steps towards these goals. I wish you all a good webinar 
and I hope you will enjoy today's and tomorrow's presentations and discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Paula Letomäki, uh, for your words and introduction to the theme. And, and it's really inspiring to hear how, how, how high up on the agenda these issues are within the Nordic Cooperation. And congratulations to the anniversary, the 50 years anniversary of the Nordic Council of Ministers that is celebrated this year. As Paula mentioned, the vision of the Nordic Cooperation is to become the most sustainable and integrated region in the world and the inclusion and rights of persons with disabilities in, in sparsely populated regions and communities are of course an important matter of social sustainability, just as Paula just uh, mentioned. Now we will go one step further in the program and sharpen our minds even more, I think, and get the opportunity to learn more about how the rights of persons with disability, including dementia, intersect with the rights of indigenous persons. We had to rearrange the schedule a little bit, uh, but now we are happy to be on track again. And uh, we are moving forward in the in the program uh, focusing on the several human rights instruments and international agreements uh, that frame today's topic on the rights of indigenous persons with disabilities. And now again, we will sharpen our minds and get the opportunity to learn more about how the rights of persons with disability, including dementia, intersect with the rights of indigenous persons. So welcome to the stage, Professor Jared Quinn, the UN uh, Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I know you are with us, Gerard. And before you came, we just um, told everyone to imagine that we are actually not in front of our computer screens, but we are up in the northeastern part of Sapmi in the wonderful hall of Sayos. And welcome to the stage. Thank you so much, uh, Maria. Can, can you hear and see me okay? Perfectly. Very good. Well, I want to thank you uh, for the opportunity to address you today and Thank you indeed for organizing this really, really important event. Uh, when I became the UN Special Rapporteur last year, I announced that one of my thematic priorities will be Indigenous persons with disabilities around the world, and especially as an aspect of intersectionality. We haven't as yet commenced that work, uh, but this event gives me an opportunity to share some preliminary ideas with you and more importantly, to learn from you. We've just finished our first thematic report on armed conflict and disability, which is sadly very topical at the moment around the world. Uh, and we're about to move on to a consideration of artificial intelligence and disability which is a game changer for every single human being. And hopefully shortly after that, we will commence work on the rights of indigenous persons with disabilities. What kind of questions hang over us today? Well, first of all, what does international law have to say about indigenous persons and groups with disabilities? Secondly, how does it help us frame or understand some of the missteps in the past, and there have been many around the world. And thirdly, and perhaps more importantly, what does it point toward? Does it require of countries a fresh policy imagination? And I believe it does. Uh, to answer this, uh, to set it up, to set the table, I just want to focus on three main points. First of all, I want to be crystal clear or as clear as I can be about intersectionality, what it means and what it doesn't mean. Secondly, I want to talk about its implications for the human rights framing of indigenous persons and persons with disabilities. 
because I think it's uh, rather profound in how it reshapes our frame of vision. And last but not least, I want to talk about the new agenda. What of the future? It's very well and good to analyze the past, but does any of this point a pathway forward? And curiously enough, I think it's the mix of ideas about intersectionality with newer approaches, for example, represented by the UN Sustainable Development Goals that point together to the future. So first things first, intersectionality. Clarity here is very important. It's probably true to say that intersectionality or the move towards an intersectional approach came about as a result of a dissatisfaction of traditional human rights approaches and especially in the area of discrimination law and practice. The traditional approach was to the effect that difference of treatment or discrimination had to pivot on one clear ground, like race or disability or age or indigeneity, and that had to be demonstrably unequal relative to how others were treated and a clear legal or compensatory remedy would have to be identified. Well, none of us are born with a single identity. There's something highly artificial in requiring persons to be labeled as one group or another. And justice isn't just about relative treatment. It's not how I'm treated relative to others that really counts, and um, that would just reduce justice to the relativities of treatment, for example, disabled versus non-disabled. It's got to mean something deeper than that. Uh, some, in fact, say that this traditional approach is morally empty. We have to broaden the frame to go beyond relativities of treatment, and I think indigeneity is a really good example of that. And do traditional legal remedies really uproot the root causes of inequality? There may be a lot of satisfaction in winning a case, but should we not aim for more? Does social justice require more? And another thing, and I think this is the key thing, one of the problems of unequal treatment or differentiation or discrimination, call it what you want, is the implicit and sometimes explicit privileging of one group over the other. This has real life material consequences for the life and life chances of the disfavored group. Worst of all, the disfavored group may internalize external judgments, creating what's called spoilt identity among themselves and helping to reproduce underlying wrongs. I think one of the important in insights of intersectionality, <coughs> building on the overlapping nature of our identity, our identities, is that one person may experience multiple sets of privilegings, black, disabled, religious minority, indigenous person, person with a disability. And this is the important thing. It's not just additive. It's not just one thing added to another. It's not just multiple discrimination, so to speak. It's that the combination of the privileges creates something new, an extremely difficult mix to extricate oneself from. So the effects aren't just additive. They're cumulative and extremely difficult um, to, to extricate. What's the cash value of all of this? Uh, how, how do these ideas animate change? I think it depends on whether your worldview is a narrowly legal worldview or it's much broader than that. From the traditional lawyer's point of view, intersectionality hasn't made too much of a difference. We still practice equality law very much on a ground-centric approach within race, within gender, within disability. Uh, or we lead off with one, for example, disability, 
and then maybe add another like age or dementia and so forth. Comfortable, courts are comfortable with this. They tend not to expand on these new theses like cumulative disadvantage. I think there are a lot of explanations for this and I won't go through them. But all of this leads to a different insight, which is that maybe we should be looking at the broader human rights implications of intersectionality beyond litigation, beyond court-centric approaches. When you stand back and think about it, most equality law is about providing a platform to test whether one group is treated equally relative to another group. That tends to be a reactive process, one that relies on the resilience of litigants to go to court. It's good in itself, it's even vital, but it's not enough. From a policymaker's point of view, you tend to ask, and you should ask, a different set of questions once you shift to an intersectional framework. Why do I say that? Um, privileging has been very subtle in the past, but very impactful. Key gateways to the life world, the world of work, of social interaction, were shut unless you conformed to the dominant group. So I think the real value of intersectionality is that it forces us to face these deeper and often uncomfortable questions. These are highly uncomfortable questions in societies that have ruthlessly and rigorously excluded the other. Um, of course, the whole point is to find better ways of acknowledging and valuing difference and better ways of applying or providing for moral repair for the wrongs, the systemic wrongs done in the past. We have moved on the series of UN thematic equality treaties covering various vulnerable groups is now well developed in gender, in race, in disability. What we desperately need is a thematic treaty on the rights of older persons, which would amongst other things, cover people with dementia. That's another day's story, and I am quite active on that debate here in the UN system. Slowly but surely, the existing treaty bodies that interpret these treaties are climbing out of their ground-centric silos and are beginning to acknowledge intersectional aspects. In turn, they're beginning to ask the harder questions of states, the deeper systemic questions of states. One interesting result is why insist on independent living just for people with disabilities? Why don't you equally insist on it for older persons too, and particularly those with dementia? And these questions are beginning to bubble up in the system because intersectionality is being taken seriously. Indigeneity, as you know, gets a passing mention in the preamble of the UN Disability Treaty. Unlike gender and youth, it's not directly factored into the body of the treaty. Why not? The answer is simple. It's nothing to do with principle. It has everything to do with power politics. Indigenous groups were present during the drafting, especially from New Zealand and Canada. And in fact, uh, Kiki Nordstrom, who is part, a very proud part of the Sami community, was present during the drafting, but representing the World Federation of the Blind. Their issues were relegated in importance. And as I say, this had nothing to do with principle and had everything to do with the power or the relative lack of power of the groups at the table on the day. However, however, the CRPD committee has shown itself alert to intersectionality between disability and indigeneity. One can see the full panoply of rights, civil, political, economic, social, and cultural at play. Civil rights open up a theoretical space of freedom for persons to manage their own lives. 
this space was literally closed down for people with disabilities through, for example, incapacity laws, which disproportionately affect people with dementia. Political rights offered some route to rewrite those wrongs, but even recently, the European Court of Human Rights has sanctioned limitations on voting rights for persons with disabilities in a Danish case. And indigenous persons around the world probably constitute what's called a discrete and insular minority, unable to wield political power commensurate with their actual numbers. It's interesting to see historically how social rights or social systems were constructed either to exclude or to cushion or compensate those who were excluded. Segregated education facilities for both indigenous persons and persons with disabilities set in train a self-defeating logic of exclusion in later life. Cultural rights, ah, uh, I think we're coming to the core. The policymakers' question is how do we reverse embedded cultural assumptions about inferiority? How do we flip the privileging of certain groups over others? And how do we flip the underlying cultural assumptions to be more receptive to the inherent rights of indigenous persons with disabilities? Most people forget Article 8 of the UN Convention, which is obliging states to nurture their populations to become sensitive to the rights of persons with disabilities, and that would include older persons with disabilities, including those with dementia too. In my work on disability, I want to build on the UN Declaration on the Rights for Indigenous Persons. I'm particularly animated by Article 5 of that declaration to the effect that Indigenous persons have a right to maintain and strengthen their distinctive political, legal, economic, social and cultural life and institutions. And I do believe that the UN Sustainable Development Goals moves us in a direction much more receptive to the rights of Indigenous persons, particularly in its new philosophy of the economy and the society, its emphasis on people and place and the wisdom that comes from that, particularly in the context of Indigenous persons, its de-emphasis of consumption and a different attitude toward the environment, and its insistence that those who are left furthest behind will be moved forward much faster. I will do so in very close cooperation with the UNSR on Indigenous Persons, as well as the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Culture, which I think is absolutely crucial. I thank you for your time, and I very much look forward to the interaction and indeed the outcomes of today. Thank you so much, and back to you, Maria. Thank you uh, so much for that, Gerard. It was a pleasure to hear you again and uh, congratulations to your new role, uh, perhaps the most important one in the system, uh, if you ask several, uh, uh, several of us. Uh, I have asked the uh, audience to uh, write questions in the chat. I don't know if we have any as yet. Um, I'll ask my colleague to alert me on that in that case. Otherwise, I will ask you, we have just recently, all the Nordic countries started to get into the cycle of reporting and dialogue with the UNCRPD committee. And uh, we are all learning. And some of the Nordic countries have reported details on the on the situation of uh, indigenous persons with disabilities in the reports or have received questions. You have mentioned some other um, countries, for example, New Zealand and Canada, but Canada, but do you have any 
suggestions, any other countries or state parties to the convention that might be good examples for us to learn from? Excuse me, <laughs> just drink some water. <laughs> Um, I, th I think it's also useful um, looking at the work product, some of the ideas coming out of the special rapporteur on the rights of indigenous persons. Uh, he's actually here with us in Geneva at the moment, and we're discussing what some future work will look on, will look like on disability and indigeneity. Um, also, I think the, the new UN special expert on the rights of older persons is particularly interested in dementia and the overlap between the CRPD convention and maybe what the new convention, uh, hopefully on the rights of older people will look like in the UN system. And I would actually encourage your groups to get active in the debate about what shape should be put on that convention, even from the narrow perspective of the rights of in indigenous persons with dementia and how they should be treated in that convention. Uh, and I would also say that the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Culture, uh, her work product could be really, really useful to you in uh, substantiating your arguments before the treaty bodies um, I'm not sure if she has looked so far at indigeneity, but I'm sure she'd be extremely open to it. My own experience is very much on the traveler community in my country, uh, where there are similar issues uh, with the, for example, the Sami in your country. And I have more experience also with the indigenous groups in Australia, which is quite a fascinating um, historical experience um, and, and could put you in touch with some people there. Um, should, should I just add that many years ago, uh, wearing a different hat, I drafted my government's first report on the Council of Europe's Framework Convention on National Minorities. And that's a very unusual usual treaty in that it leaves up to states parties to define who your own national minority is. And for us in my country, it was the traveling community. Um, but I, I remember distinctly Finland because you actually denominated the deaf community as a national minority and we're reporting on that. I don't know if that has been added to, but it's, it's also an outlet worth keeping in mind as you strengthen your own advocacy. Sorry, that was a very long answer. Thank you so much for that. And please just take your time. We uh, appreciate your time and, um, and your insights so much. And uh, we have another question and from one of the participants from Steve Holst in Denmark, uh, who represent the, um, uh, the civil society organizations, the, the organizations representing persons with disabilities. And she asks how uh, the disability organizations can support the governments in the implementation of the conventions and other uh, international agreements that overlap um, in order for them to, to see the whole picture. That's a great question. <laughs> and actually, that's one of the questions we're addressing this week. All of the special rapporteurs are meeting this week. Uh, there's 44 thematic special rapporteurs and then 14 country specific rapporteurs, for example, North Korea, um, uh, Myanmar, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the interesting debating points is, is exactly where are these substantive overlaps, how we can help each other, um, at a minimum, how we can avoid uh, doing some negative <laughs> damage to each other, uh, which I guess accidentally can happen from time to time. Um, and one of the ideas being floated around is that we might think about uh, creating, sorry, the lights go out. Uh, this is the, the green agenda, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately. 
Um, we're thinking of creating a platform on intersectionality um, to, number one, interrogate how we've worked in the past, some of the opportunities we've missed, and how we might work better in the future. And a classic example of that is the right to community living and deinstitutionalization. Uh, and why does that continue to have residual validity for older people, particularly older people with dementia, and not for people with disabilities? There's a profound disconnect there. And by opening up the intersectional dialogue, we'll at least begin addressing that, if not resolving it. I'm sure it's going to be an issue when we eventually get round to drafting the Treaty on the Rights of Older People, which I hope is going to happen fairly soon. Thank you so much. Is uh, just a question uh, from 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 my side, and is the um, um, the the principle or or the um, the important fundamental aspect of the disability um, cooperation? No, nothing about us without us. Is that practice or tradition or so as fundamental in other? UN work that you are familiar with? Very much so. I mean, it's it's emblazoned right at the front of the Disability Convention. Um, <clears throat> but others have taken their cue from that. And particularly uh, elder rights groups are, are saying the same thing. Um, they have come along a different line of evolution than the disability groups. Maybe the disability groups were a bit faster uh, for whatever historical reason. Uh, but I, there's a very interesting inflection point now in elder rights groups around the world. They're becoming less and less driven by people who are in the sector or control the sector and more driven by older persons themselves. And they're taking a leaf out of the book of people with disabilities uh, and hopefully taking that process of considering drafting a treaty into their own hands and interacting very much with uh, governments very directly. I think um, if you want evidence of that, look at the changes happening in the last year, two years in the um, age platform Europe which is now an extremely interesting, positive, very dynamic body. Uh, so yeah, I would say that's, that's true. Uh, and the other interesting point, and this comes up um, not just with people with disabilities, but also older people is interestingly, there are new um, opportunities on the table for looking at ancillary issues that we've ignored completely in the past. And one of them is on carers and the future of families and family involvement and connections with older people and people with disabilities. Uh, I don't know if you share this with me, but I was very personally disappointed with the EU Green Paper on the rights of older people because there were a few throwaway lines in it like, oh, isn't it unfortunate that women are no longer available to mop up all of the caring duties of the past? Not thinking that, well, actually, that was quite discriminatory when you find that all of the opportunity costs in the labor market were just out the window, which meant that their social security rights into the future were diminished, which created not only poverty, but also mental health stresses later on in life. So there's a very interesting window opening up to consider in the rights of carers. Um, not that that's front and center, but at least it's part of the equation into the future. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Hello, can I ask a question? 
Yes, I'm Jan Hofter from the Finnish uh, Ministry for of, uh, Social Matters and Health, and I'm working with uh, matters concerning older, older persons' rights, also the persons with disability. If, uh, disabil persons with disabilities, thank you for your presentation. It was excellent and very inspiring. I would like to ask uh, if you could tell us some more about the uh, convention on uh, or the convention to come about. The the rights on persons with uh, uh, with elderly older persons. It would be very interesting. It's very uh, interesting question when we are ra now reforming the both legislations in Finland. So, so this is a very big question uh, concerning age and and uh, disabilities. Thank you. Thanks very much for the question. It's very important. Um, colleagues may not be aware that for the last ten years or so. There is what's called an open-ended process in the UN system for considering proposals to draft a convention on the rights of older persons. Um, about six years ago, a conceptual paper was drafted by the Office of the High Commission, which set out the conceptual framing for what a convention might contain, what it could look like, um, but it was left very open-ended. Uh, more recently, the Office of the High Commission, maybe about five months ago, uh, put out a second version of that concept note, and it's, it's extremely important. It was uh, put together by Andrew Burns in UNSW in the University of Sid in Sydney in Australia, uh, one of the world's eminent experts on human rights and older persons. And I think we're edging closer and closer to a drafting of that particular treaty. One of the interesting findings of Andrew's researchers was that one of the reasons why it failed to get off the ground in the last 10 years is about how the ar argument was framed from civil society. They tended to fall back into very traditional argumentation about almost exclusively about economic, social and cultural rights and older persons. So in the wrong eyes, that was just perceived as adding to the cost of states rather than actually directly addressing issues of human rights. I think that framing has changed. And if you read Andrew's paper closely, he shows how the framing has changed and why it matters. Um, so, for example, issues of protection and social security were very much the traditional issues, but now the issues coming to the foreground uh, are issues like autonomy, maintaining autonomy into older life, with supports, of course, and community life and flourishing and um, hidden things like the quality of our social connectedness um, in, in later life. Um, and all of this is in Andrew's paper and you'll see very, very well. We think that a number of key EU member states are beginning to change their viewpoint on this. Germany and Austria, for example, seem to be coming around to the view that a convention, there would be some added value in a convention in dealing with ableist assumptions in law and policy in all of our countries. So there's no country in particular, it's every country. Um, only about three months ago, the UN system has produced a world report on the rights of older persons, which is first ever in the UN system. So I think the mood music is beginning to be good. Um, the arguments are beginning to stack up. The traditional arguments um, are giving way to newer arguments about autonomy and community living. So I would say we're at a more optimistic point. Uh, of course, COVID hasn't helped things uh, and the economic damage done by COVID around the world hasn't helped things. But I think everybody knows that we need to create space for an aging society. And that means dealing with the legacy of ageism from the past, 
we're trying to deal with the legacy of ableism from the past. Now we're super adding on to that ageism as well. So it's it's an exciting period, actually. Thank you. Um, there is one more question in the chat. Um, it's from Margareta Utiek from the University in Umeå. And she's thanking for your interesting speak and is asking how are indigenous people with disabilities repre represented in the development work? Can you answer that, please? <clears throat> well, uh, what I can say is when we open a project, like we will open a project on the rights of indigenous persons with disabilities, we always consult actively. Uh, we usually put out a call for inputs, a worldwide call. Uh, we're very proactive in who we reach, and we usually have convenings. Now, in the past, they were physical, uh, but on the armed conflict report, it had to be virtual. Uh, the virtual has some advantages. We were able to reach people around the world who otherwise would not have been able to, to attend. And we think that will be highly advantageous when it comes to the report on indigenous persons with disabilities. So we're only at the beginning stage of thinking about how we put that together, but we totally agree it's got to be done in active consultation with the community. Uh, I'm quite close to the community in, in uh, Australia uh, and also in New Zealand. Um, one of the most amazing advocates at the disability uh, treaty negotiations uh, was uh, Huhana Hickey, who was part of the Maori community, um, who attended all of the ad hoc committee meetings and had a big influence there and afterwards. So we'll be, we'll be coming back to you for sure. And I, I'd love to connect with the Sami parliament in particular afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gerard. Um, Maria is now back. Can you continue? Do you have your voice, please? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for 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 that. It was interesting listening to you while having a minor computer crash. <laughs> I wish we were in Sios, all of us. <laughs> Actually, it was a little bit sweaty. Uh, thank you so much. I think I think this uh, this uh, topic of uh, inclusive working processes is something that we um, uh, try to uh, develop also here in the in the nordic arctic uh, collaboration and we have had some um, some interesting differences between the countries how we uh, how we structure the the collaboration and, and really interesting dialogues on that and and when it comes to inclusion of uh, persons uh, from especially vulnerable groups, but also quite strong groups, but but maybe not organized in, in traditional, you know, these, um, well, bureaucratic ways, then it has been difficult. So in, in within the Nordic region, we have and, and the inclusion of, of for example, um, indigenous persons with disabilities, it has been quite a lot of differences in, in how um, how it looks. So it's a really interesting topic, and and I didn't hear you uh, very well on on the question on how persons with dementia uh, can be um, included, uh, well represented, but included themselves. If you could just uh, say something more about that, uh, I know that you have also um experiences of of uh, inclusion of persons with intellectual disabilities in in these uh, kind of working processes so so if you could just mention a few examples yeah we're going to be talking a lot more to the special rapporteur on the rights of older people from germany who has a, a long track record in inclusion of people with dementia in research processes and so forth so we'll be beginning our conversations with her very shortly. Uh, this is a project that will take place probably during the latter part of next year. So it gives us a lot of time and a lot of space to, to consult with you and people like you to see how we go about doing this. Because we wanna make it as inclusive as possible because if it doesn't address 
the real issues that people have in their lives, it isn't very much use to states as well as to us. So absolutely, that's a priority for us here. Now there is one, thank you so much. There is one more uh, question in the chat, but since I restarted, I cannot see it. Can somebody from the back end repost the question again in the chat? We can ask the question for um, thank you. Anna Ida Halgard Jonsson, and she is asking, um, how, uh, have you a concrete example on how you will work on the intersection between indigeneity and disability, please? Um, not yet. I mean, I'm intuiting that issues of autonomy, issues of community, and what does it mean to belong and to participate and to help shape your own community will become particularly important. Um, we're having lots of interesting dialogues with the SR on older people on community living and deinstitutionalization. I hope that's not an issue for you, but it is in some other parts of the world. Um, so th it's too early yet to identify clearly what the issues are we will focus on. We'd like that to be a process of you telling us inductively, and then we can work from there. Thank you so much. Well, I think it's time for us to, to uh, say thank you, uh, Jared Quinn, Special Rapporteur uh, for, the persons, for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities at the UN. And uh, good luck with your meetings with your colleagues, with overarching all of these important perspectives and, and the work that you do. And please let us uh, keep in contact. And, and I'm sure that we can learn a lot together also in the future. So thank you so much. Thank you, Maria. It's always a delight to connect with the Nordic Council and your good selves. And could I just encourage you to connect with my colleague on the rights of older persons, Claudia Mahler from Germany, who is just amazing. Thank you so much for Thank that. You. And now I think we're ready to start again before this short break. Uh, we had an excellent presentation by uh, Professor Jared Quinn, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, who had a presentation on intersectionality and how the um, uh, rights of persons uh, with disabilities and indigenous persons intersect and are protected by the human rights instrument and uh, other international agreements on inclusion and equality. Now we will have another as important uh, presentation on uh, the other aspect of the rights that we are talking about today, and uh, that is the rights of indigenous peoples. And I have the pleasure to present and bring you up to the stage of Sayos, Laila Susanne Vars, uh, who is a member of uh, the Arctic uh, Cooperation and the United Nations Expert uh, Mechanism on the Rights of Persons uh, with indig or Indigenous Peoples, sorry, the United Nations Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Thank you, and uh, Laila, please take the stage. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I hope that the technical um, technicalities are working, that you can hear me. If not, then in, please indicate if the sound is not working. Um, as said, my name is Laila Susanne Vosch, or in Sami, uh, they would say, or I would present myself as uh, Inguna Susanna Elemaria, Laila Susanna. Uh, that tells everyone uh, who my uh, ancestors are four generations back. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to um, present to you um, a very short introduction to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I will also 
uh, comments on the mandate of the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples, which I'm a member of. Uh, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, in the end of my presentation and you can also direct questions to me in North Sami which is my uh, mother language. I'm hoping that you will be able to uh, see my screen now. Let me see. So probably have to do some um yeah can you see this uh clearly now uh, perfectly I, thank you perfectly thank you so much i can't see the chat so so you just have to take the floor if there are some uh challenges well um this is a very uh, large topic of course since this is a uh declaration um a global United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It is um, a very, um, the, the most important document for the indigenous peoples movement. And it also represents a big step towards the international community of states and peoples accepting uh, the rights of indigenous peoples uh, not merely as the rights of minorities, but also as rights of indigenous peoples, the rights of peoples as such. Um, I'll start by saying something about the declaration itself. Um, how did this declaration come about? Uh, it's a lengthy process. Some say that it started when the first indigenous person um, contacted the, um, the uh, United Nations, the, the predecessors of the United Nations, uh, the League of Nations, and started uh, also promoting indigenous people's rights. Um, since that, it has been an international movement uh, of indigenous peoples, indigenous peoples organizations, also other supporting organizations, both international, national and local, uh, working towards a common goal of having a, a United, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, safeguarding and promoting the rights of Indigenous Peoples. It is, um, it represents a universal framework of minimum standards for the survival, dignity, and well being of the indigenous peoples of the world. Um, it also elaborates on existing human rights standards. And this is a very important point since uh, there has been in, in uh, both legal literature and also in politics, uh, we are often um, hear that people question uh, that the declaration is uh, in fact based on international human rights standards. And it is, it is also uh, something that is highlighted by many national human rights institutions, by the United Nations bodies themselves. And it was clearly stated also when the declaration was adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2007. Uh, but as it elaborates on existing human rights standards, it gives also an opportunity to apply them to the specific situation of indigenous peoples. And, and this is important as uh, many indigenous communities and indigenous peoples uh, consider that their, right, uh, their rights are collective by nature. Uh, not meaning that indigenous peoples don't have individual rights, but that the collective rights are important. And that is what often um, differ indigenous peoples own understanding of their rights from international human rights standards, which uh, by large are formulated as uh, individual rights. But also the international human rights standards include um, standards that are 
um, protect the rights of groups, uh, minority groups and such. So since the adoption of the declaration, where you see from this presentation, there was a majority of 144 states in favor. There were only four states that voted against, and we had 11 states who didn't actually support or vote against. Of a vote against. And I should also be very quick to um, add to this that years light, later, the four countries that voted against, which were New Zealand, Canada, Australia, and United States, have actually reversed their position and now support the UN declaration, which is very important since these states have a large population of indigenous peoples. So what is the basic basis of the declaration and what are the fundamental right, rights it protects and acknowledges? Well, the right to self-determination should be mentioned, particularly since that is um, a collective right for any people uh, to decide their political status and pursue economic, social and cultural development. Uh, for a long period of time, um, states understood this right as, also, uh, as just a, a right merely for the majority population and not for indigenous peoples. Or actually, more specifically, it, it is a right for, um, in the, uh, for uh, the majority people that actually have established a state. So right to self-determination was understood as a, a right to statehood. Now, this is a very, uh, this is an understanding that is no longer um, existing or it exists in some environments, of course, but it's the international understanding, uh, the understanding of the right to self-determination under international law now also includes indigenous people as right rights holders to the right to self-determination. Article uh, 3 expresses that right and also Article 4 says something about uh, how indigenous peoples, when they're exercised this right to self-determination, that they have a right to autonomy or self-government in matters relating to their internal and local affairs, as well as ways and means for financing these autonomous functions. And here the Sami parliaments are examples of um, a way of um, exercising the right to self-determination or self-government for the Sami people. There are some fundamental principles of international human rights law that's uh, reflected in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the UN RIP. Uh, most importantly, non-discrimination and equality, uh, which are fundamental components of uh, international human rights law. And they're also essential to the exercise and enjoyment of civil and political, economic, social and cultural rights. Article two of the declaration provides that indigenous peoples and individuals are free and equal to all other peoples and that indigenous individuals have the right to be free from any kind of discrimination in the exercise of their right. Uh, the right to equality and non-discrimination requires that states combat both formal and substantive or de facto forms of discrimination. And this should be very um, similar to those uh, discussions that we have also uh, regarding persons with disabilities. The elimination of formal discrimination may require that a state's constitution, legislation, regulations or policies do not discriminate against indigenous peoples. And the elimination of de facto discrimination requires states to implement laws and policies that facilitate substantive uh, so substantive equality for indigenous peoples in the enjoyment of their rights. 
So non-discrimination and equality are fundamental components also in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So how, why is this uh, declaration relevant for the, for the topic of this seminar? Why is this important also uh, when you talk about the rights on the national level and Indigenous Peoples' rights on the individual level? Well, the declaration um, itself uh, should be implemented both internationally, but also regionally and nationally. And you could add also locally. Um, say a few words about how uh, a declaration is being implemented internationally. Um, most uh, international conventions have their own way of implementing. You have states reporting on their implementation on the national level to different UN uh, bodies, like the treaty bodies, and also the UPR, which I will mention a bit later in my presentation. Uh, normally, declarations don't have the same procedures of implementation internationally, but the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples are very special when it comes to implementation. There's a lot of bodies and entities that are responsible for implementing the declaration. And the United Nations bodies has various times stated how important it is that the declaration should be understood as an expression of existing international human rights law and that it requires active uh, implementation from states. But it's not just merely states that are um, that are obligated to implement. You also have intergovernmental organizations like the EU um, and you have different bodies within the United Nations system like the United Nations Human Rights Council that is also important when it comes to uh, states respecting the rights uh, in the declaration and also making sure that states uh, respect and implement the rights in an effective way. And then you have the body which I'm a member of, that's the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples or as people who have worked in this field for a long time call it, it's the EMRIP. Um, our mandate is uh, exactly to make sure that there is a dialogue between indigenous peoples and states when implementing the um, rights in the declaration. The expert mechanism uh, has also in its mandate, has different parts in its mandate. Uh, one part of our mandate consists of a country engagement part, which is uh, quite interesting and, and developing. Um, it uh, gives an opportunity for states and indigenous peoples uh, to engage with the expert mechanism and to invite us to country missions where we can give uh, technical advice on a various uh, number of legal issues. And it has to be in some way or the other related to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. But we are there to assist Indigenous peoples and states and to strengthen the dialogue between the parties in matters where there is a challenge of finding a national or even regional solution. Uh, the expert mechanism also has a number of studies. Uh, we have uh, uh, you can find them on the expert mechanism website, which I can um, put in the chat uh, later so you can read them. And also we have um, our annual report, which gives a very interesting uh, snapshot of the situation of indigenous peoples worldwide wide, and how um, the implementation of the human rights of indigenous peoples um, how effective it is in different regions of the world. We are seven different, uh, uh, seven members of the expert mechanism representing, representing the seven 
social economical regions of indigenous peoples of the world. And um, as mentioned in the introduction, I represent the Arctic region. And just a reminder, I can't see the chat. If there are some uh, uh, issues, you need to just uh, stop my presentation if there are some uh, issues regarding the, the PowerPoints or a sound. Um, also, an important body when it comes to the implementation on the international level is the United Nations Permanent Forum for Indigenous Peoples and not rights. It shouldn't say rights there, but the Permanent Forum uh, is also a very important body when it comes to um, both promoting the declaration, uh, sharing information about implementation and also advising states uh, on how they should implement the declaration and also highlighting some of the uh, more political uh, issues regarding the implementation, for instance, of self-determination of indigenous peoples. Uh, the United Nations Permanent Forum is a very important policy maker and is also um, a, a meeting place for indigenous peoples worldwide. And hopefully now after the COVID-19 um, COVID uh, period, Indigenous peoples will be able to meet again at these important forums, um, including the Permanent Forum. You also have the other UN agencies uh, that are actively involved in the implementation of the declaration, including the ILO, the UNESCO and the UNICEF, just to mention a few. And they all work within their mandate to make sure that both uh, the human rights uh, conventions, but also the UN declaration is being implemented. And then you have uh, what is probably also of, of uh, most important when it comes to indigenous peoples, it is the implementation on the national level and on the regional level. Uh, states, governments and government agencies are uh, the ones who have the power to, to implement different, kind of, different kinds of measures when it comes to uh, implementation of the UN DRIP, the declaration. And I have just mentioned a few ways of uh, implementing and unfortunately, to my knowledge, none of the Nordic states have actually adopted national action plans when it comes to the implementation of the UN Declaration. And that is really unfortunate since a lot of countries in the world see the Nordic countries as really uh, positive, uh, supporting indigenous people's rights, um, affirming those rights in, in different uh, forums. Uh, so a lot of um, colleagues from other parts of the world are really surprised when they hear that the Nordic countries hasn't uh, adopted national action plans uh, implementing the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So that is something that will also affect all spheres of society, since you don't have like a common a goal and a common plan for different sectors, including health sector, including children's rights, women's rights, rights of elders, etc. States uh, have also the uh, opportunity or the obligation, I would say, to implement the UN Declaration through legislation, through their policies, through strategies, for instance, the High North strategies, which are highly relevant for indigenous peoples in the north, and also other types of measures, like different kinds of programs. And I should add also that this um, um, obligation for states to implement is not merely uh, an obligation for the government or departments or ministries, but it's also an obligation for municipalities and counties. And then there's always the question of the private sector, like the industry, uh, if they have some obligations. 
and this is an ongoing discussion since uh, in international law there is uh, this principle that it's uh, states as the main um, uh, main uh, body for for uh, implementing human rights. How should you then include the private sector into this? And we see often that uh, this becomes an issue when it comes to different forms of um, controversial development projects in indigenous people's areas, where um, both uh, activists, indigenous peoples organizations, indigenous peoples rep representative bodies claim that the private sector should be held accountable for their own um, activities. But it's, um, but it's of course challenging since the, it's the state who gives the, um, uh, who decides uh, that the private sector is allowed to, to have activities on indigenous people's lands. But it's a very uh, dynamic part of international law and you see um, this part of the human rights um, system developing very rapidly, also including the private sector as, um, as a duty holder when it comes to respecting indigenous people's rights. Some of you might know the process of business and human rights as one example. So, uh, monitoring the implementation of the declaration is, of course, very important since we have a lot of monitoring mechanisms. And the expert mechanism, which I'm a part of, we're, we don't do monitoring. Uh, we do advice and we do dialogue, but there are other parts of the UN system that do um, monitoring. And I have mentioned a few in this presentation. Uh, first, you have the UN treaty bodies, you have the Human Rights Committee, you have the Committee uh, for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, the CEDAW. You have the Convention or the Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the third. You have the Committee uh, for the Rights of the Child. And the treaty bodies are important since they uh, are the ones who give advice to states when it comes to implement implementation of the rights of indigenous peoples. They also have this periodic reporting system uh, where states send in their reports uh, on a periodic, um, in a periodic cycle, uh, reporting on how they are implementing for instance, when it comes to the rights of Sami with disabilities or Sami children, uh, Sami youth, uh, when it comes to media um, in Sami languages, uh, teaching material for Sami children and youth, when it comes to uh, rights, um, different kinds of, of, of rights. And then you also have the Universal Periodic Review, the UPR, uh, which is a quite unique process, which involves a periodic review of the human rights records of all of the 193 UN member states. And the UPR provides an opportunity for all states to declare what actions they have taken to improve the human rights situations in their countries and to also overcome challenges to the enjoyment of human rights. Laila, UPR, sorry, I have to remind you of time. Yes, I will finish in a few minutes. The UPR also includes a sharing of best human rights practices around the globe. And currently, um, to my knowledge, there are no other mechanisms of this kind. Um, I've also men mentioned the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the special, other special rapporteurs as important monitoring mechanisms. And then you have other in international organizations. I've just mentioned one, which we uh, at the Sami University are collaborating with right now, it, which is IVGIA. And we're working on uh, monitoring the national uh, implementation of the rights of indigenous peoples. Lastly, 
I have the regional and national monitoring mechanisms. Uh, and then you have the regional and national human rights institutions, which has an important role when it comes to the implementation of the UN declaration and also the ombudsman, uh, ombudsman's. And then you also have uh, started developing in indigenous, international, national and local monitoring mechanisms. For instance, in New Zealand, you have an, um, an indigenous uh, monitoring mechanism for the rights of indigenous peoples. That was actually what I was going to say about the UN declaration. Uh, that was all I had time to say. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Uh, we um, uh, appreciate so much this uh, incredible mapping of this uh, field and how the rights of indigenous peoples are protected and promoted in the in the UN system. And it was really good to hear that uh, maybe the Nordic countries are far ahead, but we are not best in class when it comes to, for example, the national plans for implementing uh, these important uh, rights and and uh, and structures and the intentions of the of the declaration. So thank you so much, Laila. We, we have to move for, move move along in in the program, but please, if you could stay, and maybe there will be some questions for you in the chat, uh, or we can come back uh, to you later. Thank you so much, and I will have the privilege to introduce uh, Janne Hirvosvopio again, who is a member of the Social and Health Committee of the Sami Parliament. He was with us uh, earlier in the webinar. And uh, Janne is also a representative uh, of the Sami Parliament in the National Board for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which is the monitoring mechanism for the implementation of the UNCRPD. In, in Finland. So, Janne, over to you. Thank you. Now we have the slides here. Happy to be with you all here. So, um, Laila Susanne already discussed about the content of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So I will concentrate on the Declaration more from the perspective of Sami Parliament in Finland and focus on its implementation here. So if you could, yes, thank you. Um, however, before we're going, before we're going into that, I um, also want to emphasize the status and the meaning of the Declaration as one of the most important documents which offer guidance for building equal societies in which the rights of indigenous peoples are fully implemented. It is the most comprehensive international instrument on the rights of indigenous peoples at the moment, and it combines important elements from international human rights law regarding indigenous peoples to one document. The implementation of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples has not been a success story in Finland so far. Even though um, Finland voted in favor for the Declaration without any reservations, we have seen a lack of political will to start to develop and implement national action plan to achieve the goals of the declaration. There is no adequate data available regarding the measure taken to implement the articles of the declaration to the national legislation, not to speak of the concrete results or changes achieved through these measures. Finland's support for the declaration has was reaffirmed in the outcome document of the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples in 2014. In this outcome document, in paragraph seven, Finland has committed, and I quote, 
to taking in consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples, appropriate measures at the national level to achieve the ends of the declaration and to promote awareness of it among all sectors of society. According to the operative per paragraph of eight, uh, paragraph eight of the outcome document, Finland has committed itself also to, and I quote, to cooperating with indigenous peoples through their own representative institutions to develop and implement national action plans, strategies, or other measures where relevant to achieve the ends of the declaration. And we look forward to Finland to start delivering on its commitments. Even though it should be already self-evident in the world that we are living in 2021, I still want to repeat one very important message of the declaration. Indigenous individuals are entitled without discrimination to all human rights recognized in international law. The operative paragraph nine of the outcome document concent concentrates precisely on promotion and protection of the rights of indigenous persons with disabilities. It urges states to continue improving their social and economic conditions, including by developing targeted measures for the aforementioned action plans, strategies or measures in collaboration with indigenous persons with disabilities themselves. This is something that we consider essential when developing national action plans. There is no one else who could better speak about actions or measures that Sami persons with disabilities need than themselves. So to be able to meet the challenges and ensure the well-being of Sami persons with disabilities, we also need more information on their situation. We need more concrete data on services that are already available and what still need to be, um, what still need to be developed. We need data on the possibilities to use Sami languages, this person's mother tongue, in social and healthcare service. And we need more data on discrimination that Sami persons with disabilities are exposed to in the Nordics, <clears throat> in the Nordic societies. In the operative paragraph 10 of the outcome document, member states, including Finland, have committed themselves, and I quote, to working with indigenous peoples to disaggregate data as appropriate or conduct surveys and to utilizing holistic indicators of indigenous people's well-being to address the situation and needs of indigenous peoples and individuals. In particular, older persons, women, youth, children, and persons with disabilities. Currently, there is not enough data available concerning this minority group within Sami. As one homogenous um, or from the other perspective, minority group within persons with disabilities. Often surveys view Sami as one homogenous indigenous people or persons with disabilities as one minority group. Reality, as we all know, is not that simple. These questions need to be approached through intersectional lenses to achieve more comprehensive understanding of the situation of the Sami persons with disabilities. To be fair, recently some development has happened and few publications have been published on this topic. But the lack of existing data is pointed out also in those research reports. This would be something concrete to bring forward in the future. And for these kinds of actions, we need more resources. Finland has committed to everything that I have listed in my speech today. And now we call the state and state representatives to take concrete actions. This webinar is one step to the right direction. 
And we hope that this will also bring some concrete measures that improve the situation um, of Sami with disabilities. We also hope that cooperation between different actors in Sami society will develop further in the future. At this point, I would like to thank you all for the discussion and of this seminar. If you have any questions, uh, our own Anna Landsman Marka will be here to answer any questions you might have. Um, and thank you all for coming on behalf of me uh, and hope you have fruitful discussions today. Thank you. Thank you so much again, Janne, for a great uh, and very clear and powerful set of messages uh, to um, several, um, several, I, I suppose, political decision makers, but also to us uh, all in this webinar to um, learn more and to understand and to see, which you made really clear, that it is possible to see these intersectional perspectives together and get a holistic view of, of the needs and the rights of per indigenous persons with disabilities. And so thank you for that. I cannot see that we have any uh, questions in the chat as it is right now. And I know that you have a time to um, that you, you have to, to leave quite soon. Uh, so I think if there is not a chat question right now, we will let you go, Janne, and we thank you so much for your interaction here with us, and we are looking forward to keep in contact through different structures that are here and maybe future collaborations uh, between the Disability Corporation and the, the other um, Sami uh, representative institutions and organizations. Thank you. Thank you. We will move to the next uh, part of the seminar, which is uh, two comments from civil society organizations and rep uh, organizations representing uh, persons with disabilities and persons with dementia. And uh, we will start uh, by uh, inviting Cecilie Marie um, Jacobsen, who is chair of the uh, Greenlandic Umbrella Organization representing persons with disabilities in Greenland. So I hope that we have Cecilie Marie with us here. There you are. Welcome. And. Uh, I will just invite you to share your comment on the topic presented here today. And I know that you jumped in in the last minute. So we are so grateful for that. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I did have a presentation uh, ready. Uh, where do I find the presentation? Do you have a presentation on the computer? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in the in the in the lower part of the Zoom program, there is a green sign that says ah, share yeah. screen. Yes. Uh, I only had a day <laughs> to to prepare, so. Um, my name is Cecilia, and uh, and I am uh, uh, the chairman for NIG, which is Nunatini Inu in And NIG has uh, five members, uh, which is Inokat, who has uh, de de uh, developmental disorders, an autism for aiming association or autistic. Uh, children and Sugisa, which is a relative association for the mentally ill, and uh, Kotiko, which is a hearing impaired association, and uh, Isi is a visually impaired association. 
And I have uh, some uh, points I want to talk about, which is uh, handicap spokesman uh, and sign language due to education and COVID and discriminations uh, to, due to young students with psychological issues. And we need an anti-discrimination uh, law in Greenland. And why do we need that? And I want to come into being homeless in Greenland with mental disorder. First, the handicap spokesman. Uh, unfortunately, Han Christina Johnson <laughs> resigned as a handicap spokesman since April this year, and we haven't got a new one yet. And the uh, and Nick, us, uh, we haven't been uh, invited to a meeting at, at the government about the handicap spokesman. So we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, we've been um, asking the government what is the next plan. What, what's going to happen and what's going to happen with the previous recommendations that Tiliok made with Christina, what's the plan with them, uh, especially uh, the handicap law implementation uh, to the rest of the country. We have kind of governmental issues with cooperation uh, with within the handicap area. Ooh, sorry. And sign language in Greenland. Um, yeah. I've been asking the government for sign language for the uh, COVID-19 press conferences, but unfortunately we haven't got any response. Uh, some of the people with hearing impairment in Greenland, all, all over Greenland, have been miss, missing out what, what was going on. And uh, uh, some of them uh, missed out the vaccines and some of them missed out the test centers that was going on in, uh, in their cities. Also, hearing impaired has not have the possibility to take any education in Greenland due to no sign language support in classes. Not only in the <coughs> educational area, but just uh, going to the doctor or going to the, uh, what's it called, commune, to talk to a caseworker. It's not possible at all. And uh, discriminations due to young students with psychological issues. I've been wanting to uh, take this issue because I think it's very important. Students with mental disorders as part bipolar or schizophrenia with suicidal thoughts are more likely to be expelled from the school. Example, uh, this summer, uh, a young woman with bipolar disorder was almost kick out, kicked out of school because the principal was afraid of her behavior or suicidal attempts would infect the school. The principal said to the family, uh, there, there is about 500 students in the area. I don't want other students to have suicidal thoughts. So the young woman had, had no um, possibility to be able to go on with her school. So she had to self-study uh, to be able to uh, finished school and she did that and um, she had uh, one of the highest scores in school when she finished. 
and another young girl with schizophrenia had to stop with her education due to ignore, ignorance of her disability. And with that, the last one was, uh, is my daughter. Being homeless in Greenland with mental disorder. Uh, Greenland only have one psychiatric department with 19 beds. And we have about 1500 people with ser serious mental disorders. Most of the homeless in Nuuk uh, has a mental disorder. I think it's uh, about 70% of the homeless in Nuuk. <laughs> and I will come into that more. Most of the people with mental, mental disorders who have done some crime are being sent to Denmark with no sight of uh, to, return, to ever return home again. People with serious mental disorders are denied, uh, actually are denied to have an apartment or to be able to move to a, to a housing unit. Uh, because there's no resources or no place for them. Oh. An anti-discrimination law in Greenland, why do we need that? We need that because of the young girls who want ed an education. We need that because of the young man with schizophrenia can have a place to sleep and ha have that comfort and not have the stress to go around and uh, being afraid to sleep uh, outside. We need that so people with mental disorders can have a job without being afraid to be misunderstood. We need that because so people with different disorders can make uh, can have a choice a chance to make it in life thank you for listening so thank you so much uh, for that presentation and and uh, presenting some of the severe challenges that that you meet uh, in, yeah. in Nik and from your organizations. I know that uh, Nik is uh, a quite new umbrella organization, has yeah. only um, existed a few years. Three, three years. Yes. Do you experience that you reach the government better since you collaborate more or uh, when Christina was a handicapped spokesman, we co cooperated co with her to be able to, to uh, make a point to the government. We don't have a Christina now, so it's very difficult to us uh, and to Tilia, uh, which is the organization of the handicapped spokesman was. Uh, they're, they're also having difficulties to uh, reach out uh, and make a point to the government. Thank you. And what, how important would you say that uh, the, the language and culture aspects of the services and everything uh, around uh, Nick? Uh, the issues that you discuss are this. Um, I I know I talked to some some representatives from from organizations in Greenland a couple of years ago, and then there was a discussion on uh, Danish and Inuit languages in the in the social services. Can you say something about that? Uh... I think that uh, Bisse Safik, who's going to uh, present something tomorrow, can say more about that. But uh, I talked to uh, uh, 
the chairman for the uh, hearing impaired yesterday there's there's no progress okay thank you uh, will you stay with us for a little bit and perhaps there will be questions in the chat to to both you uh, and um, the other speaker uh, from uh, Sami Suster, who is, uh, thank you so much, Cecilia Maria. Uh, we will come back to you if it's okay. Thank you. Yes. And now I invite uh, Maria Pieski from Sami Suster uh, to give your uh, views on this topic. Okay. Please. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, I will speak in, in Northern Sami language. So, ja antaa si alku sinne challan tän alko uusi tuon olle pähpärä ala nuotte pure päiviti kiire puhkaide pure seminaara vasevälti ja kultaleet kiht ja kiihtutan erinomas seminaaras mitä läidubo ja Sahta on juotki. Mun ammalla Merja Pieski. Ja, ja, ja parkkaan säämisösteris Pirkenruhtus prosehtas Taimapaadallin. Ja lämpö poh pohta muihtali säämisöstera Pirkenruhtus ja muihtohalla prosehtai parkii väsähusai muihtopuhtsi arkapäivis. Ja min toimakuovluun han läh aanara, äänodaa ja ohtsoa kieltä ja vuotsu. Lää on tulkkoon päässä. Joo, nää on nuu. Jäte mun iskan, mä ei edes muihti. Joo, tähän jälkeen toi. Muihto jämi, munko. Vai toon? Muihto puhtsi munin koihto lää. Muihto puhtsi vuotta tähän dementiä. Ilä ässi, man lipsi älki mietihi, altsisi tähän muihtali hieraittai. Tänin olmossa tämä kuhka iska tsehkä tämän, että se on iso halmalla kai muihto puhtsi. Namalassi ilä tähpi muihtali hieraitta, jos alttis tai pierrasis tai he soasla muhtun vättisvuota tai he hastalsa. Puerehla tuolla hässi pierrasa siste. Nupata, ahte ei muihte, kulla mai taita ässiide, tahla hiehpaa. Faamulas mai la iespirke jumi jurta, olmos kalka pirke ies. Vaikkein blipsii mii tähpähuvan tai he tähpähuvan minsu iellimis. Ferte pääre pirkehalla. Lämmaittai vättis kauna tietoi, koi teede kieskalkkasi jierra tai he kiesä välti oktavuosa. Outalko muihtohalla prosekta älkki, te äilän veel muihtotivsärä, mutta täällä kaunoji muhtun kieltään jo muihtopuehtse tivsärä. Ja vähkillä kaunomis. Tehalas lämmai kulahallan. Ja ätten. Tantihtiillä puerre touta kulttuura siskalta stävi ja vuui. Outa märkä tihtii ja askodemi. Tahi aalo aivil ahte olmosla seamma aivil toon ja tohkiha taan maita nuppii tottia. Seamma lahkai mankassa heillä härjänän vaitali. Paitse lähtee hui soavalatsa vai Ke ei lytseenu tuutavat tän tilläimisis lää. Aina ii kalkka jena paajiirit. Stuorra ja alla herra, ko tää nuuna märrituvon, tän verte tohkehi. Tasa ii väie maitie. Mänki, min kuovlu olmohla vääsihan, ahte siin tarppuin iilä märkkasupmi. Puera ahtelän jaska, maimun tääs tussi vaitala. Ja semmassa ahte jurtsi, kään kulttuura vuodul, mi pläne toimmai. 
outa merkan, nuorra parki poodi vetsä muihto puhtsi, farrui pehässäs puudal teämmäi. Muihto puhtsi loe, vuoh mun kalkkasin toina määnäis tuohka, inke astasi, ii musla tilli tääl manna piikän läht. Aina pehässäs lottii puudal teämmi. Mii varra suomakulttuuras kehtsojuvo muihtopuetsi aktiveeremin. Iilän kassie kullan su arkapäivä. Ja tän oktavuodas se on tulkuja, te se on kalkkasilä männäpiikan, tän nuorra parkai. Ja stahka suinna, ja tasahan iilän suskal äiki. Siemma lahkai saht jerrahte. Mii pahla tuu mielamiel porramus. Ai, mun mielamiel porramus. I mun teede. Munhan porran viiso mii mun ja attojuvo. Iila älki muihtali heitys ainui, ko härvelä leamasan väljen munni. Nuupah tänke hääve kalkaimme kuhki häike häälesti, vai mielamiel porramus ah maittai kaunojetje. Oi! Koihke perkulai mu hersko. Tahla nu jalka ja torski. Tam mun liikon porra. Se ammalahkai sähtäs mehtä. Maila lohpi parkat. Lävuorra suholmus lohpi voingasti. Ällin tilli. La kuhka leamosan täkkär. Ahte, aalo la kalkan parka oolu. Tälin lähtään vetsä muorai, likke taalu, määlesti, tiksu määnäi, fuolai siivihion, tutjot. Nuhte iilä leamosan lohpi tsohka kuhka, tahje vellesti senki kaskupäivi. Nupahla vätti soots vuorrasuholmu voingasti kaskupäivi, ko outalke iilä sähtä nuuparka. Kiinu veel kättahte mundan läihki. Tanin lähe tehalas ahte mii tiehti olmo ällin historia. Ferte muihti ahte muihtopuhtsi i aalo muihte. Vaikke häälitip tsie muihti ja vaikke se on löedäs min luhte, se on sähtälä aipas ieramäilmis ja äikkis. Outa merkka tihti, okta ahku maanai piirra orrunlaanja ja keesi nuppi jolki eetst maangis. Kaskohais on piisäni ja ruuvi taina julkiin lähteraanu rääsi. Ko järren, no miipä täällä tähpähuva, luois on. Oi voi, väivi, ko täh ruska häivulkke lähti seere, vaikke se on mohpassa. No, se on leito peets männävuota ruoftu lähti passa. Lää tanin tehalas tjälli paajas vuorrasuholmu jällin historia. Vai mii sähti puerpuh ädde sin lähtema ja reakeeremi ieralaan ässide, jos sillä muihto huuvan. Kohas mii voi leki kässe päihkäi. Joola äiki. Vaikke se on niin länke fitnan sun männä vuota kässe päiks maankalo johkäi. Leis on tääl tollemin tohko miästä juohkepäivi. Aina kässe päihkis lei aalole amasan sun mielas nu soome. Ja veel tääskotaan kähtsä te. Kässe päihkisellä säämekulttuuras viitti märkäsuppi, kun valtokulttuura kässe partas. Nuupa, mate puerepuhtoutta, muihtopuhtsi ällin historia, tade nannosu, ajepas vuota toutu, susleä. Muihti ja muihtasi. Lä väives ja unohas toutu, jos olmos fuomma, ahti se on niin muihte. Nupa, älä taaja munje, jos orruahte, in voi muihte juur maitie. 
Ich pahto muihte. Täällä väive skaadsalta munje. Muusaltan vuo hiehpani koniin muihtee. Muhtumin olmus lamai aips lahpon. Ie teede koosas on leimannamin tai ja koos pahtimin. Läh fiinna rustea, ma almuhi oatmahatsaide koos mun lään. Muhto, mai dalle, koin muihte pitkitan kihti. Tahje, tahi taimma, ko oorunnu toares pelte. Talle tah äila mun ja torvu. Muhtumin munin muihte ahte mullan aitto puuraadan. Muslannu käffe koihku ja läipe miellä. Äle suhta munje, jos jeeran lää käffe, vaikka aitto letjenke käffe juuistan. Munin pääre muihte, in lä härtimin tuu. Mutta ärvihman pokte mun muhtumi muihtan ja muihtasan. Na, puores koovai pokte. Toppela munje oaps olmo ja pirrasa. Tai mun liikon kähtsä ja muihtasi tai olmu ja äikki. Ja tää saalan pitjan muhtun koovai. Täkkär koova muihtu toi me mänkii kuulahallan kaska oapmin, min te aivad ja minkä. Ja maittai muihtui lassin pohte oulu maitnasi. Maitnasi hoitnosi ja kullan lahkai. Muihtasi haajai. Jienai ja suongai. Ärpe virolas porramusa ja tai määlestä, mi pukte oolu muihtui sihke haajai ja smahkai pukte. Lipsi huipu erre ahtela veijolas vuotta peässä porra, ohpes porramusai, kumposi, märfi, koihkepirkku. Tienu luosa, tallekotan lei lohpipiytit, rauttu, luopmäni. Kalli täkkär herskohla fallojuvun puorrasi siitä. Lipsi sooma mai peässä tuulastalla. Kulta oli lotti viitsärteämen, joashavamin, skitoostärhtemin tai jemisi roukamin. Lää pusehtas ruhta ja tarvai parki taas. Napa makkär pirrasis mun lään. No kuhka ko peasana ruoftus, lämus aatjepas toutu. Napa parras ei siittas. Täällä nu kolkko, nu kolkko. Tekär kaamuspäihki, iilä ruoftulaan. Tohko in hääli. Nupa kään vääräs tai muistopuhtsi piiras lähuksejuvon ja ornejuvon. Ja suongai pirra. Musiikka tollo juvo hui tehaladjan ja äntäli min kuovlus. Lähden hän sluttaa nu snart, ei näin te läsä, men tack ändå. Osku läleämässä mankasiitta storra rollas. Nupa salma ja pare salma kirjii norkka peältelä hui ohpasa ja tai kullan ja laulun pukte holu muihtui. Tän salmalla ääni mun ja laulon unni vuoda rääjes, muihta oli muhtun jo alle puores ääjä kaanja tsalmiin. Ja talle mi pohti ketan tsuvovas päivi ja ihta tsai fäntäi, sääme killi vai valto killi? Tääviä puh palvelussa lähe valto killi, siivan tasalla mänki parki väilevas kiellataitu. Vaikke orosi ja säämekuovlus, koos kalkkasilla huika vuotta säämekielä palvelushaide. Tätä häillä fitnemis. Oota märkä tihti vuorosuholmo tiksun ja palvelan plaana kalkkai ootasmahti. Ja suomakielä parkilei pohtan sulu saatan parka. Vuorosuholmostatja. Ahti sun jälä vähän vättis äättehtän suomakielä. Ahti säämekielä lipsi älki. Tasa parki. Miillä suomas kalton verte tan verte suomakiella mähti. Nuupa, vaikka sä mälas orrue suoma pelte, ison aalo mähte suomakiella, tahje i mähte tannu puures. 
se on sähtä mahti arkapäivi sääni. Muhto tjeknalu sätneratju vailo. Kallis mi mahti vieriskielain muihtali min viejus ja pakchasiin iera sääniinko. Aipas ok. Kiihtu kultalemis. Thank you so much, Maria, for that. Uh, it was so interesting to hear you speak about how to meet a person with respect and understanding. And um, until everybody does that, the persons with dementia does not have the rights everyone deserves. And and holds. So thank you so much. And it was wonderful to hear you um, tell us a little bit about um, the ways you think about this and how important singing and storytelling and uh, is for you. Thank you so much. Uh, and also maybe about the the difficulties to talk about this in many situations, how you can be ashamed maybe, and uh, that it's difficult to speak about, about having uh, dementia. Uh, I also remember that you took up the issue of language, how important it is to have Sami services uh, and especially when people start to, to forget, uh, but also throughout the whole life, I suppose. Thank you so much. Uh, I will look in the chat if there is any questions to Cecilia Marie or to Maria. And uh, there are no questions here. I ask my colleagues in the technical back end of the, if there's any questions, no. So, okay. And the, from, from the organizers uh, side, we thought that maybe we could look at the videos again that were shown in the, in the, um, break, the first break, and I don't think I had the time to introduce the, uh, the video that well, because the break came a little bit suddenly. But I will just, before we do so, say thank you so much for coming uh, to this webinar. Uh, we have had about a hundred participants, which is fantastic that we could only wish for. And uh, we um, uh, have learned a lot today about how to think uh, about the rights of indigenous persons with disabilities, including dementia. And we have heard about the human rights, high level um, documents, the conventions, declarations, the UN system around these rights that frames the way that the countries are supposed to implement um, strategies, laws and systems to meet the needs and to promote the rights of indigenous persons with disabilities around the world. And we have a long way to go because during the day we have also heard about challenges. We have heard the voices of human rights mechanisms, experts, and from people living with disabilities and dementia themselves uh, and their representative organizations. Now I think we are ready to show the, the films again, the videos that, uh, has, that have been prepared by the Human Rights Center in Finland. 
and also a short documentary which is called Open About Dementia by Aldring och Helse and Helse Direktoratet in Norway. And I will stay here and say goodbye to you all after these videos. But if somebody would leave before that, I say thank you again and welcome back tomorrow when we will be more into the organizations and the service provisions, the, the different systems for reaching uh, out in society and providing the social support and help that people need in sparsely populated area with special regards to culture and language sensitive uh, service provision. And we will also talk about discrimination, multiple discrimination and how that can be uh, acted against. So please stay and watch the videos with us. If you don't, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye bye.